Hey, ¿qué pasa, Calexico? Welcome back to the podcast. Uh, like always, before we begin, I want to thank a couple of people. Uh, I want to thank my sponsors, my friends Jake, Sergio, Camilo, and Dylan Castillo. I also want to thank David Gastelum. If you're thinking of buying or selling a home, a home in the Imperial or San Diego counties, make sure you contact David. He's not only a realtor, but an investor with over 20 years of experience. His number is 760 235 9576. Today's guest, um, you know, we've seen a trend here in the Valley, not only in the Valley, but across the, the nation where, you know, a lot of young people are getting involved in politics and, and their community. Um, today's guest is a, I mean, I, I, I'm going to say he's young because he's way young, younger than me. <laughs> <laughs> um, today's guest is uh, Carlos R. Hernandez, who's running for the Central Union High School uh, District School Board for the short short term. I want to reiterate that um, short term. Oh, another thing that, that I want to mention is that this is not an endorsement. Um, I'm only interviewing as many candidates from around the Valley so that you, the, the community, can get to know them and, you know, make a better decision when it comes time to vote. Um, but yeah, this is not an endorsement. It's just, you know, me interviewing the people so that you get to know them. So, um, Carlos, thank you for being here today. Yeah, thank you very much. I appreciate you having me. I appreciate it. Um, normally, I, I, I try to, you know, have my guests tell us a little bit about themselves. I think it's a good way for, especially when it's a, you know, situation like this where you're running for, you know, like like an elected official for the people to get to know you. So can you tell us a little bit about yourself? You know, I know you're in, in education. Uh, you've been, uh, you were born and raised in El Centro, am I, am I right? Yes, that is correct. So, <laughs> Yeah, I was born in born and raised in El Centro. I, I grew up. I went to Hedrick Elementary, then Wilson Junior High, and I graduated from Central Union High School. and And I, I am I've been in education. I want to say honestly, I mean, not just as a student, just my whole life because um my mom and dad uh, were educators, and then my dad went into administration, and and my dad actually uh, did teach in Calexico, and he he was a teacher at dual school. And then he ended up uh, teaching at Blanche Charles Elementary, and he was in a principal there. So even as a kid, um, a lot of my time was spent after I would get out of school or during summer school when he teach summer, summer school, I would be with him at Blanche Charles, and I'd be in his classroom over there in Calexico. And oh. and I mean, I've been fortunate enough that even a lot of family in Calexico is also, um, you know, in the education system. I know one of my uncles that uh, I would spend a lot of time with. It's very very funny. Um, is uh, Mr. Pacheco. I think a lot of people um, don't don't know that. Yeah, Louis Pacheco, he's my oh. uncle. So oh, growing up, you know, I, I was with him all the time at, at Jefferson. Um, I, I would I would I was always at his house and and him and my dad, you know, as, as they're having their menudo and things like that and boxing fights, they would be discussing, you know, education. So even though even before I was an educator and just a student, I always was kind of hearing the talks about education and about districts. And, and things like that. And, and then my, my dad and my uncle ended up being a uh, kind of working together at one point where my dad was the assistant principal and, and, uh, and my uncle was the principal at Jefferson. And so they got to work together. So I got to hear all those talks. And my aunt, Annalisa Pacheco has been educator at dual, at dual school elementary and, and still is. And uh, my cousins, Marcos ended up going into education, who is also a Calexico born and raised. And, and, and he graduated from Calexico as well. So I have a lot of my family that has been in there, my my uncle Augustine Ramirez, I know worked for the district and you know handled all, all, a lot of um, I think behind the scenes works of, of warehouse. I think he was in charge of like buses and, and things like that. At one point they called him Gus. I know he goes by Gus in the district. That's how they know him. And so I've just had family not just in El Centro, but you know in Calexico as well. And my grand my grandparents are from there. And so I spent a lot of time in Calexico too. And, and around those schools, Blanche Charles and my dad moved there. I remember going and seeing like, it was so cool because it's an inside school. Yeah. And I was so confused. Like, I was like, whoa, this is crazy. Like the AC and those long halls. I remember the lamps and not going to lie. Like when it was empty, I would like run up and down. I mean, I was a kid as my dad would be working in his classroom uh, with my brothers and, and things like that. So uh, education is just kind of in my blood. I didn't think I was going to go into that as a teenager. I was like, nah, nah, I'm going to do something different. But it looks like it was just meant to be that yeah. in education. I've been in it for, I started with kindergarten and then I switched over to high school for a while and then alternative education. And now I'm back. I'm a second grade teacher, Powell Central Elementary School District at Sunflower. Oh, well, so like, it's crazy how like you've taught kindergarten, high school, and now back into elementary. Um, 
I was I was watching your your chat with um Gil, and um yeah, uh, I heard that you've you've worked in uh private private uh, sector as well. That is correct. Yeah, I did work in in private sector. In, in fact, I would say half of my educational experiences in private sector I did in in Arizona private schools, and I did it in California private schools. And and in Arizona, I did elementary private school, and I did um high school, private school. And then in California, I did a high school, private schools. And it, it was very, um, it was really a learning experience for me to experience private schools. Cause growing up, I, I just was in public. I was in public education. I, again, Hedrick, Wilson, Central, and then my college, I didn't go to a private college. I went to, uh, I went to IVC first. I started IVC very young. I was uh, 15 years old, actually. Oh, wow. I don't think even people in high school knew that I was doing that. Um, my dad even tells me now, he was just like, I never realized that I was dropping off my <laughs> son to go to school, like, uh, with these like adults or people that were older. And so, yeah, I would, I started IVC when I was 15 and then I, I ended up transferring out and I, I went to UCSD for my undergrad. And so again, pu a public college and, and, it was, and it was a great school and I liked it, but yeah, that that's a little hidden thing that I, I honestly I don't think my my friends even knew and, and people that I went to high school with did not know I was going to college while I was in high school. Um, it was just a, a goal of mine and and I wanted to get some credits um, beforehand because I knew that I had to go to IVC first. You know, it was a discussion with my parents and my, all my brothers did it. I have two brothers, an older brother and a younger brother, and we all went to IVC first. And from IVC, then we, we transferred over to a university. And, and so I was like, well, I want to get ahead of the game <laughs> and I want to get some units in there. And, and it did pay off because before I transferred out, uh, I was able to take some fun classes. I took piano, I took theater, um, I took a singing class and I had to <laughs> sing a little bit. There's some like funny stories that, but it was just to, to become well-rounded. You know, I, I, it was something that, you know, I got to have some fun. I kind of de-stressed before I took off to a uh, university. Oh, okay, yeah, that, that's. I mean, that's super weird that you were 15 and going to to IVC. Yeah. I mean, I was yeah. 15. I was probably running around Calexico, like up to <laughs> no good. Um, <laughs> be, I mean, being in, in in you know that you you've had had experience with the public and private sector. Um, you know, what are some of yes. the biggest difference that you've seen? I know that you know in the. I mean, I've worked in public in public sector for t almost 20 years or over 20 years. And, you know, there's a lot of bureaucracy, there's a lot of uh, politics, you know, what's one of the biggest things that you've noticed in between the two uh, sectors? Between the two different sectors, um, what, what I noticed was in the private schools, the, the, the little advantage was since they're private, they kind of had a little bit more control of what was going on in terms of they could make a decision in terms of, let's say, for example, mm, I want to say like levels of, of, of classes. So in a private school that I worked at in California, they were able to have different levels in math in geometry. There was three levels of math. There was the high, the medium and the lower level. They, they had, they had it like advanced regular, and then they called it geometry B. So they just, they just had labels of that. And, and when I went to the public, um, that was not as easy to be accomplished due to like, it's some people consider it tracking and things like that. And so in the private schools, they have a little bit more control of how they can control their classes. Now, they still have to follow also all the standards, you know, of, of California and things like that. But at least they have that control of if they feel, hey, I want to actually put levels of math. And they're able to give an entrance exam to students to go to that school since it's private. And I know some people think that's very exclusive. And I mean, they're a private school for a reason. But I thought as a teacher, when I saw it, I found it very interesting to have those levels because when I taught in it, I felt that the learning environment was very nice where you had students at levels where they can, you can go at a pace to optimize, to maximize their learning and their potential. And then some people say, well, um, what, what about the, you know, the, the lowest level of geometry? What about those students? And the way it was seen in the, in the private sector for some schools that I worked at, even in Arizona, they had different levels. 
they saw it more as we're not knocking if a student loan parents understood it too. We're just, they just understand, Hey, this is where my child is at. This is where the student is at. And we're trying to maximize their learning and put them in a classroom where the pace can be, where they don't feel as stressed and we can get them to the point to the higher level. The goal was never for them to stay at that. It was just, Hey, you know, if they show that they want to go higher, they could. But also if they felt they needed a slower pace and the teacher can accommodate, you know, that pace, they broke it down. And also the second biggest one that I, I noticed from going from private to public, and it's a small one, and I'm sure people see it often, is the numbers. So teacher to student ratio was a lot lower. Um, it was for the lower classes, it was like a one to 22 ratio, one to 20. And then the higher classes, like let's say in the highest level of geometry, that was like a one to 28, a one to 29. It never really got to 30, but it was like a higher, higher twenties. And then in the lower level, it was like one to 22. And that was both in Arizona and in California in the private schools that I worked at. The student ratio, student to teacher ratio was, was lower. And I, I think that was very, it, it, I mean, again, you, you have more connection with the student, you're able um, to answer more questions. It, it's just, that that was the most common thing that I saw from private to um, public. That that was very eye opening, I guess you can say. Yeah, um, I mentioned earlier that there's a lot of you know younger generations you know getting involved um, in politics and and yeah, just in general in politics. Um, was that a factor in you know making you decide to run, or is it just what made you decide to to go ahead and run? Yeah, so to to go ahead and run, there there was many factors. Um, one of them was that I, re I remember, um, so I went to Nicaragua and I helped build schools there um, for, for a couple of weeks. It wasn't like I was there the whole time, but I, I was there for a couple of weeks and I got to help build schools and, you know, help them get running water and got to meet students there. And when I was there, it was with the, with the private school. Some students from the private school went as well. And it, it was, it was great, but I kept, I noticed, I kept asking myself like, you know, what, what am I doing in this private area? I, I should be going back home. Like I, I need to be helping my community in, in terms of like try and bring what I've been learning from all these private sectors and try and bring it in, in my hometown. And so I ended up after, after that year, I ended up moving back and I ended up teaching at Southwest high school. And with that, that, that was part of the reason and all the stuff that I've learned pretty much in the private sectors, I was like, you know what? I think I need to get my name, my name in the hat. I need to get my name in the discussions. And, you know, as a teacher, you have a voice and, and it's good, but it's not as big a voice as I, I would want. And I know that I, I can't, I'm just one vote out of, out of five. And I get that, but I wanted to be at the table. You know, I want to spot at the table to, to have a voice and, and give my opinion and, and let people know what I've seen in these districts and what's working and what's not. What am I able to do? You know, maybe we can't bring everything from a private sector, but what are we able to bring? You know, let's let's take a look at this. You know, we were using Schoology at the private sector. Um, we were one-to-one -one iPads. I had an iPad. Every student had an iPad. Maybe we can't get that, but can we get to Chromebooks? You know, how what trainings are we going to need? I, I became an Apple certified teacher through there. I also learned Schoology through there. Um, I They would get me money to go to classes. I would get a, um, you know, I would get an allowance of two thousand dollars to use to hire my education that they gave as extra, and it would roll over a year, mm -hmm. or and I could have four thousand dollars to get either college classes or any trainings that I wanted in the private sector. Um, and that was, and that was including my salary, which it was ironic. People think that private schools get you get paid more. Now I had a competitive salary, but I actually get paid more in a public school than I do at a private school. Um, and the the school I worked at in California, I was on the finance committee and we had just passed where we upped all the salaries and we got it to any employee at that private school, teacher, custodian, anybody, then their child could go to that private school that it was co it cost. I believe it was like $20,000 a year at that time. Um, and anybody that worked there, they only had to pay $250 for the year. Oh. And their, their child can go to the custodian, anybody that worked for the school, coach, anybody. And, and that was like a big, big thing that we were really happy that we could figure that out. And we upped the salaries to compete with almost the public schools of San Diego. But it, was, it wasn't as high. But then again, you, you still get that $2,000 allowance to, to up your education, things like that. And so 
I thought it was just time for me to get a seat at the table and see what I can bring in, in, and kind of hide in or optimize, you know, the Valley, optimize the community, you know, help, help out what I, what I've experienced in, in different cities in private and, and going to public. I, I helped in summer programs. I also tutored at Huntington Learning Center and I was teaching students how to read, write, and I was helping students do SAT, ACT prep. And to me, I kept thinking in my head that I didn't, I didn't have that opportunity when I was in high school. I didn't, I didn't take ACT or SAT prep that, that, Huntington Learning Center does not exist here. And so maybe we don't bring Huntington Learning Center here, but what if we bring something similar to that or bring a class into an elective class that's SAT, ACT prep, where we have people that take, you know, that those courses, a, a teacher that wants to take maybe a training on SAT, ACT prep, and they have that class. And that gives those students that opportunity to do better on SAT, ACT prep because they don't have that Huntington Learning Center that you have to pay for and, and those, those kids just, it's not, it's, it's kind of an advantage. And I don't want our community to be at that, that disadvantage or, you know, I know some are already going to universities. That's great, but there's always room for growth, right? There's always room for growth. And I, I just want to be at the table and see if I can, you know, help us grow and be a part of that team. I, I think they're, you know, they're already heading in the right direction. And maybe there's there's some new light that I could bring to the table. And, that, and that's why it was time for me, I think, to put my name in the hat and put my name in the running. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, and, I, you know, you, you're in this uh, really unique position where, like, you've taught, you know, all these levels in education, including private and public. And um, and, I, and I'm, I'm sure you're going to get this a lot where people are going to say, you know, you're young. You know, a lot of people say, like, <laughs> oh, you need experience. But, you yeah. know, how do you know? I mean, just hearing all, like all these things that you've done and all these things that you want to bring to the table, like, um, you know, that's a, um, you know, some like I said, something really, really unique that you would bring to a board because I don't think I've ever seen somebody that's currently teaching that's on a school board, you know, yeah. and, and and not even including that, you know, you're you're young, so yeah. So yeah, I'm, how I'm, do you, how do you, uh, you know, what would you say like to somebody that says like, oh yeah, but you're young and you need experience. Like what, what would you, you know? That, that's a good question. I think for me, um, at the end of the day, there's, there's different types of experience. And I think my advantage is, you know, sometimes there's experience and then relevant experience. And for me, I feel right now, since I'm, I am teaching and I have been more current in the education in terms of what's going on now, like behind the scenes in the trenches, I think I add that experience to the table. And some people say that, well, you know, we need experience. And But I, my biggest thing is, you're right, you know, I, I may lack some experience in some things where other people may have more experience, but at the end of the day, we don't want people that have all the same experience. For example, if the board is all people that, you know, have not, are not currently teaching or are not in education and they haven't been for a while, wouldn't they want in that team, at least someone that is at least have one person there. And I think I bring that experience that's not on there right now. There's, there aren't right now people there that are currently teaching and I think I, I can bring that. And some people haven't been out of the Valley for a while, or if they had maybe in the past, they haven't been recently. And I have, and, and I can, I can bring that. I, I do think it is important for a team to have also people with a lot of experience in terms of being around education from the past and now, whether it's being on the board or an administrator. And so I, I just want to be a part of that team. I want to be maybe the young one. Even if they consider me the young buck on the team, I'm, I'm, I'm happy with taking that role because I'm confident I have, you know, enough to offer to the table of, of current experience. I mean, even a setup, uh, things like this where, hey, I could up your Zoom meetings, make the board meetings look a little more professional, uh, maybe the, the audio. So to make sure that your voice gets across. And even when it came to the coronavirus, I know a big thing where, where parents on the board were very pushing for like some type of celebration that the kids deserve more. And I, I remember at the end of the day, I was like, you know, I, I don't know behind the scenes what, what the rules were, right? 
but in my mind was turning of, hey, we could do this, or even if we did a Zoom thing, how could we optimize it? I was thinking, hey, you know, is there a way to connect to, we could connect a big projector on there and maybe, you know, we just invite the families to the bleachers, separate it six feet, you mark it down. And then the students maybe are six feet apart on the football field versus before all the parents would be on the football field, six feet apart. And maybe we could have put something together. We just had to be willing to do it as a team. And then again, maybe there's some logistics that you we, they couldn't do that. Maybe that was something they thought about, but that was something I was thinking that I know the technological means on how they could have done it. What outputs do they need? How, do, how can they connect it? You know, I have my own projector right here at my house that I used to use in schools that produces a 300 inch screen. I'd be, you just select that with an HDMI. We create a slideshow, we put that up. So I think just the idea of thinking outside the box doesn't mean that it would happen, but at least I can bring that to the table. Others maybe didn't, maybe aren't as tech savvy as I am. And so at least I bring also that tech savviness to the table um, of, of what type of mics they would need, what type of things they would need. Maybe the technology department knows it too. And, and maybe though they don't have that voice at the table and I, I can bring that voice. And I, and I think that's important. Yeah. Yeah. Like we were um, nerding out a little bit in our, you know, in terms of <laughs> stream you know what you have and stuff like that and, and yeah like uh, that's a good point because uh, like i said i'm in technology um uh, i work uh, at in calexico in the, in the district and and i don't think i've ever uh, nobody's ever asked for my input in in any of the decisions that that you know they've made um and despite like like you know you have all this equipment um i kind of have like a little bit similar not as mm-hmm. as um you know, big as yours, but I have a similar setup. And, you know, I do a lot of, like, not a lot of people from work know what I do, like the podcast side of, mm-hmm. of my outside life from work. And I, it's a it's a great tool. Like, now that somebody somebody heard that I do this, like, they were asking me, hey, can we do a podcast for the school? I'm like, sure, like, let me know. And, you know, yeah. we'll help you set up. And, and the thing is, like, yeah, like, you know, we... Even, like for me as a district i feel like we could be better in terms of technology i think we're trying to get there uh maybe not the best route but i think we're getting there but have yeah having somebody there that that knows technology like you do like f- at least for my district i think it would it would be awesome um i know with with covid you know we've a, a lot of things have been uh, been brought up to the to you know to the table in terms of you know the discrepancies and you know how a lot of kids don't have you know broadband they don't have devices you know you being being in both public and private you know you've seen i guess both sides and now being here in the valley you know you could see that you know in the private mm-hmm. sector is a lot of kids that you know have the means to have high high speed internet or or devices exactly. and now being here in the valley you know do you notice those those discrepancies yeah, a hundred percent. And it's not even just the valley. So in the valley, what ends up happening, um, bigger cities have more options. So as 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 I nerd out, the biggest option for a high speed internet here, you have two options. You have Spectrum or you either have AT&T. Like, like those are the two big powerhouses of internet. And so what throws off for that for the valley, which is unfortunate. I always look for like Verizon Fios. I want fiber optic internet. That's the fastest, right? Fiber optic type internet. I know AT&T has it, but they don't have it for the Valley. <laughs> Verizon does not have it for the Valley. And that's just unfortunate. But I think what's happening, your parents are starting to notice the differences of type of internet. I don't think people knew about it, but if you're a gamer, you do know. You're like, oh man, I have a thousand up and a thousand down, or I have a thousand, you know, 40 up, a thousand down. And if you hear that, you're like, oh my gosh, your internet's uh, so fast. So I think- even parents, I was talking to a parent recently and they're like, I just upgraded my internet. I didn't even know there were higher speeds. So I think what's good that's coming out of this is parents and stuff are realizing like, hey, you know, internet, um, maybe maybe kids always ask for faster internet and parents were like, no, no, you know, it's more expensive. You just want it for your games. But now they're realizing like, no, actually having faster internet is kind of a priority. And maybe the valley now, what will happen is maybe the people that are in control of that will, or maybe other businesses, maybe Verizon and stuff will now uh, venture out to here and say, Hey, you know, we're going to, we're going to offer Fios down here, fiber optic internet down here and stuff like that. But I think people are realizing now when a lot of people are online on spectrum, right. Online at the same time, the servers go down, you, you get less. So even if you're, you know, let's say 200 down and, but a lot of people are on the same 
network as your same channel, you might not be even getting a hundred. You might be getting only 60. And then that's where you see the lag. And they're like, why is my internet not working? And I think what's happening is parents are starting to learn the ins and out ins and outs of, of internet ins and outs of how to work a computer. And I honestly think that's a pro, even though it's a struggle, like I, like I was told Gil is everything that's new is going to be a struggle, but also at the end of it, you're always going to grow. And I think as a community, not just South Central and Calexico and Imperial and Brawley and Hopeville, just the Imperial Valley in general is going to learn a lot from this in terms of technology, in terms of what internet now providers like actually work really well, what, um, what internet providers can they get to get really fast internet? I remember my dad was thinking about it. He's like, we have the fast one, right? I was like, yeah, we, mm-hmm. you, you have the faster one. You have the second tier one. Cause my son, you know, he's in school right now. He's doing distance learning at Hedrick. And, and so my dad wanted to make sure, cause when I'm at, when I'm doing my thing, he he's taking care of him luckily. And he's helping out and, and with my mom, and he, he was wondering, he's all, hey, sometimes there's some lag and this and that. How can you fix that? So he himself, which he's on, on the board of Alcentia Elementary, now he now has that knowledge to bring to the table as well. Like, oh, you know, let's what internet are we giving them? Because I know some places offer their students free internet, which is great because you should. But sometimes it's like for Zoom, it's not high enough. You know, it's not that that 50 megabyte you know, download and then, you know, 10 upload is not fast enough and they get the lag and then the the kids still can't communicate. It's laggy. So it's sometimes it's like, if you're going to purchase something, make sure we invest the money into an internet that is going to be good enough to, for our students. And, and again, there's stuff behind the scenes. We don't know what companies offer, you know, budgets and things like that, that, you know, have to be in there to see, see all that. But, you know, I, I have that knowledge. If, if I look at something, Hey, we're going to, you know, put this much money so we could give every student this internet for free. Right. But then if I look at it, I'm like, okay, we're going to put this money, but this internet's not good enough to accomplish what they need to do. Let's let's, is there another option that we can, can we get a higher one or how much would it cost to get a higher one that we give the students it for free, things like that. So that way, you know, the money's not, not wasted. And I'm not saying that the district has that right now. I'm just saying, I know there are districts that or in, in counties that, that do do that to the students. And maybe they think it sounds great that it's free, but at least also I would know if I look at, I'm like, what's their up, what's their down. And and it's because I saw a commercial um, and that was offering internet and it was like 40, 40 down or like something up. And my dad's like, Oh, that would be pretty good to give. And I was like, no, no, I was like, hold on dad. No, do not, do not get that. That Mm -hmm. is not good enough. That's good enough for like emails and things like Mm -hmm. that. But to process high quality videos, I was like, it's going to just lag practice. Uh, process good audio it's gonna lag it's not gonna work and don't 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 get into that so i bring that to the table and you know all about that i'm sure too about the internet the up and the down and and, and i think parents are, are learning that and i think the community is now going to learn about their internet and learn um you know what's good internet what's bad internet what what matters what doesn't matter uh, learn about lag i know some parents of mine were like what's lag and like if you're a gamer you know you know what lag is really quick Um, but as a parent, you're like, what is that? And it's just like when you're moving super slow and they think that their computer's breaking and it's like, no, your computer's fine. It's just that your network is not processing the video fast enough. So it becomes very, you know, robotic, very choppy. Um, uh, something that, that Gil, um, has done really well. Um, but I, I feel that not a lot of, um, board members in general, uh, whether it's school board or city council, something that Gil has done really well is that he, he does like these forums where, you know, um, whether it's Facebook Live or Instagram, and he gives updates to the community in terms of what's going on in the district. How do you feel in terms, you know, about communicating with the community? Because I feel like, my, at least for my board, in Calexico, like, you know, they get voted in and then um, they're trying to run for re-election and that's when you see them or hear from them. Uh, how do you feel about, you know, especially now with the pandemic, you know, we've we've been able to uh, be more in contact with parents with via um, Zoom, via Facebook Lives. You know, what are your thoughts in, you know, having this a connection with the community? For me, I, I think at the end of the day, it's all about being a team. So the thing about that, I think people get afraid of just a little bit and, and it's just natural is being afraid to make a mistake, you know? And so people don't want to be blamed for a mistake. So I think sometimes people are afraid to, you know, put that on live, being communicating with the community because they're afraid to 
to look like they don't know. And, and for me, I think transparency is the best thing because me, me admitting that I don't know everything, I think is fine. I don't know everything. I don't know. I'm not going to have an answer to every question, but I am willing to learn. And maybe my other board members may have it, or maybe we all kind of have an idea, but I don't think it should be a problem with if I were to post something on Facebook or if I were to ask a question to the community and say, hey, you know, this is what I'm thinking about. This is what we're thinking about. What are your thoughts on it? That doesn't mean that I'm going to go with what everybody says because everybody has an opinion. Everybody has it. But I am going to go with like what I told Gil and what I put in my video is I'm, I will evaluate it and whatever I feel maximizes students learning maximizes teachers potential counselors potential then that's what i'm going to vote for and i think the state of mind of having a fear or just you know being afraid to make a mistake you know has to go away and i think though as a community they have to back people up as well in terms of supporting like just because i'm if i do make a mistake you know willing to accept that hey you know i made a mistake i made a call you know we we went for this and it didn't work out but that's life. Everybody, you know, you have a plan that you think is great and sometimes it doesn't work out. And that happens in everything that happens going to the gym. You have a plan of doing a diet a certain way and, you know, you teeter away from it and then, or you learn what works. Oh, this didn't work for me. This did work for me. And I think if, if, if the community and stuff it supports, you know, me supports the board supports everybody if we just become more of a supportive thing and become a team and not so quick to just you know point a finger or just be like oh you messed up and things like that i i think we can do better and and the number one thing that shows for student growth is teacher efficacy meaning teacher being a team community and that trickles i think in everything from the way down principal administration counselors if everybody's on the same page as a team then our students will grow. And a lot of people say, well, what about if you disagree? And I, I get it. Not everybody's going to agree with what is right. What I think is right doesn't mean you're going to think it's right. But the whole point of it is that when, you, when we come to a decision as a district and when we come to a decision as people or as teachers, even if you don't think it's right right now, but that's what was decided as the team, then go along and give your 100% effort so that way we know if it does work or it doesn't. And students, they pick up on that. People pick up when things are working together. If you have that, you know, that synergy, that team on, it's just like in sports. When your team is not together, things start falling apart and it starts trickling down, right? To the playing and, and in the locker room, that's why they have those things in the locker room talk, right? Like what's going on behind the scenes? Are they a team? Is there problems going on in the upper office? It's the same thing. It, 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 it's, it's the same. My classroom, I used to tell students, because I coach track, and I used to tell students that played sports, I was like, school is a sport. It's just the difference is when you're in my class, like you, you don't get a pick. You get to pick your sport. You have to do my math class. But look, think of it this way. I am your coach. You are my player of math. And when you're in class, this is practice. Just like you go to practice after school, you're in my practice for 50 minutes and we're working on your skills of math. It's practice. Now, when you practice, when you practice football, do you, when you get a new play, do you learn it right off the bat, the first try? No, you have to do that play over and over and over again until it's perfect. Math is the same thing. Science is the same thing. English is the same thing. When you're in class as a student, you're in practice. And then when's game day? Test day. I always tell students, you ready for game day? It's test day, guys. It's game day. This is to see, this is the test. What are you going to pass? Do you, do you have those skills? Do you have that playbook? The, the, your, your notes are your playbook. And things like that, just being as a team, I think is very important. And I think being transparent and I'm pretty much open to, I'm, I'm not afraid of, if, if people tell me, you know, their thoughts on something, I will hear it out, but I also will agree to disagree. That's going to happen. And I just hope that not with me or with anybody that's elected, you know, I know Andrew's running and he's a young one, a young person. He has a lot of goals um, going into our central elementary school district that he's running for. And I just hope that when, if he brings new ideas, if I bring new ideas and things like that, that, that we're supported. And it's not just, you know, if we make a mistake, maybe out of five ideas, maybe one doesn't work or two out of three don't work, but it's kind of like people should support that mistakes happen, right? Mm -hmm. Mistakes happen. And as long as we grow from it 
and they support us with that, then I think a lot of times, you know, people aren't going to be afraid to broadcast everything to be more transparent because you, you, I have that confidence that I'm not going to just be judged off one mistake, that it's going to be like, hey, I want you a part of the team. I'm the one that's representing what you guys think. That's why I'm, I'm elected. So let me know what you think. I can't promise everything, but I can promise that I'm going to listen. I'm going to bring it to the table and I'm going to try my best. And sometimes the things that you want me to do, maybe I will disagree with that. I might, I might wholeheartedly might just be like, you know what? I don't agree with that. I'll bring it to the table. I don't agree with it. But, you know, at least, at least I tried or at least I heard you out because everybody's different. Everybody has what they think is right. And that's why we have a team of five. And we are going to just make the best decision that we think works with what the public wants. But at the end of the day, we, ha we have to be open to talk to the public. And I just hope sometimes when the public talks to us that it's in a manner of I'm still human, you know, <laughs> I, you know, just if they say, oh, you know, Hernandez, you suck. It's like, okay, okay. But tell me, why do I suck? Or like, what, what do you, what would you want me to do better? What, what is your opinion? Don't, don't just knock me, you know, right off the bat. Just tell me how I can improve. I mean, nobody's perfect. No, nobody, you know, and if you are, then, then that's great, <laughs> but nobody is. And, and just, just help me, you know? Mm -hmm. And, and I don't think there's any shame in admitting that sometimes I'll need help and, and everybody in life needs help, you know, in, and sometimes I got to suck with my pride and I'll need help and I, I might have to and, and be open to saying, or we all might tell the board members, hey, why don't we make a poll? You know, what's wrong with that? There's nothing wrong with that. We, we don't have the answers to everything. We, yeah. we just have to make the best decision with the information that's given. Yeah. Um, I was watching Bill Maher last night and um, he had some some kind of poll where um, it said that 80% of Americans had a better appreciation for teachers and, you know, school um, employees um what do you think of you know making sure that you know teachers and staff are um happy how does that how does that relate to you know a uh, student achievement like being every making sure that everybody's you know you know you know has you know is happy to go to work how do you think happy that to go to work yeah, yeah i think what ends up happening is when, when, when I, when I did teach here, I, I did get a sense sometimes of that. It, it felt like there was a divide in terms of teachers versus, you know, administration versus the higher ups. And I never understood that because I always thought, it, you know, a community is a, is a team, right? I always think it's, it's just a team. And I think what ends up happening is, is not being afraid to be heard out. And when I'm on the board, if I, if I, if I get elected, I want the new teachers to not be scared to, to go to a board meeting and voice their concerns. No teacher should be scared that if they voice their concerns, that they're making waves and that they're going to be judged for it. And I think that's wrong. We, we preach a growth mindset. We need to practice a growth mindset in terms of, I need to learn from every, I don't know everything. And a new teacher, if they don't have tenure, if they still think there's some room for growth for the district, for the community, for anything, for the Imperial Valley, they should have no fear of, oh, I should wait until I have tenure or I should wait because I'm scared. I don't want to make any waves. I don't want to ruffle any feathers. That shouldn't cross a teacher's mind. And, and I think that's what we need is we need teachers to believe in, in the board, believe in, in everybody. And, and you can't please everyone. That's just, you hope you can. But I think if, if you're willing to at least listen and, and try your best, I think we grow from that. And, and I think people will accept, you know, if a mistake is made or, or if anything, as long as they're heard out, you know, because obviously I can hear five people out and three people, it's like sports, three people like this team, two like the others, they make their case. So obviously I'm going to, I have to pick one and I might pick I'll pick one. So the people that didn't, you know, I went their way, they might, you know, not like it, but I still made the decision that I believed in. And at least I heard them out. So I have full decision. And I think that will help teachers, you know, be happier. I, I think teachers just want to be heard. They want, they want to know that 
that they're the ones in the trenches. They're the ones that know what they need. They're the ones that know what kids need, what their students need. And they're in there. Students needs change day to day. Like, you know, you, you learn so much about a kid one year, you, you have this, you know, you have this class and you need, you, you adjust your classroom to, to accommodate all those students. The next year you have a whole new group of students and you're like, Oh my gosh, what worked last year, I need to change it up, but I need to do it this year. And I think, we need to help teachers that they're not afraid to change. They're, they're not afraid. They're supported that if they need to get the materials to, to accommodate the students that they have, that they have that. If they believe that certain classes are needed for their kids, for their foundation, for their students, that we provide those classes and that we hear them out. And if we can't do it, I think the teachers deserve an explanation of why. This is why we can't do it. And that's where I'm saying of transparency. I know you need this class. I know students need it right now with X, Y, and Z budget of this or this legislation or this, we cannot do it right now. Let's see if we can figure out in the future how to do it. Let's work on it, but we can't do it right now. And I think teachers would accept that because they understand that sometimes, you know, we don't make all the rules. We have to follow certain protocols just like they do. And sometimes it's just out of our hands for now. We need to find a way to do it. And I think teachers would appreciate that. Uh, teachers are fine. People are fine when they are explained why. Like for me, when I can't do something, I, I like an explanation. Okay, why can't I do it? And if it makes sense and I understand it, it's like, okay, great. And I'm just glad you did your best. And you know, I, you know, you tried. And, and I think teachers want that. They just want to be heard. And I think even if you're a year one teacher to a year 30 teacher, you're just as important. You're just, you are a teacher, you know? And you're just as important as a person that's been there for 30 years. I know sometimes some people might frown upon that, but I do believe that that is important. We need to, we need to stay away from just because you're a year one teacher. And I, I'm not saying everybody's like that, but stay away from, you know, give the confidence, boost up that year one teacher, let them know that their voice can be heard. Let them know that their opinion can be shared and even even if you think it's not a, a favorable opinion, you know, share it. Don't be scared that, oh my gosh, I, I you know, I don't have tenure. I don't want to get anybody upset. No, I mean, share your opinion. And, and if, if, trust me, if, if it's a good one or if it's, it's going to make something better, people are going to listen. The right person's going to listen and, and, and it's not going to, it's not going to be negative. Yeah. Um, if, if you get elected and say like every buddy that got elected had one wish as a board member to accomplish something in their district what would be your one you know wish my my one wish for if i got elected would be to see our students succeed in terms of bridging the gap of the whole idea of private sector slash san diego slash big city the moment i hear students saying that they that I don't hear any more of like, oh, but I'm from the Valley or, oh, I'm from the Imperial Valley. The moment I hear that, I feel I made it. I did what I wanted to do. My, my thing is I want people to say, I am from here. I am proud of here. So when they go off to a four-year university or they go off to their, their job trainings, when they go off to, if they join the army, that they are proud and they're saying like, oh, well, yeah, I'm not from San Diego. I'm from a small town, et cetera. When I went off to university, you know, I had people that went to the same school, high school uh, as Barack Obama. Like they, they went, they didn't go with him, but they went to the same one. They, ha I had people ask me like, oh, you know, what, what SAT prep did you do? And I was like, oh, well, <laughs> what is I, that? <laughs> I didn't do an SAT prep. I, I didn't know. I just went in and took it and things like that. I don't want students to feel like they were later on at a, at a disadvantage. And I know there, that we there, I know the district has grown a lot since I've been in high school. I, I don't doubt that in my mind, but I, I, I want to continue that growth and I want to add some new to it. And so the moment I hear more students saying, you know what? Nah, I, I don't feel any like less. I, I, you know, they're, when they go off to whatever UCSD, they go to UCI, it's the students that make it to Stanford or Harvard, things like that. When, when I hear that they're, they're there and that they're, they feel like, you know, I, I was ready, that's how I know I made it. And I'll know I'll make it when students start seeing that the ceiling is not here. The ceiling is up here, right? 
you create your ceiling. Do not think that just because you're from the valley or anything like that. I know that sometimes is a state of mind for some, and they need to see that. And the moment that I start hearing students saying, you know, I do want to go to this college, but I think I can do better. And I know I can because I'm going to take this class. I'm going to take this SAT elective class. I'm going to, I'm going to go see my counselor because of scholarships. You know, this, the, the counselors do a great job. But one thing I've noticed is in, in the private schools from when I was in high school, and it could have changed over time or not all high schools, you know, but one thing I've noticed is every student, right? Your, your lowest 20 that get called in because, you know, they, they're trying to figure out how to get them. We know also just as many times as the low students were getting called in the private schools, the high students, the students that were their top 20 of their class were getting called into the counselor all the time, like literally like every other week. And it was because they were telling him, hey, you have the grades to apply to Harvard. Have you ever thought about going that? Here are the scholarships for that. Their scholarship, the scholarships in private schools were insane of, of how much money. I think there was one school that I worked at that their class, and it was only a class of a hundred students of seniors, they got over a million dollars in scholarships wow. total. So like, and, and it was, they were, they were just on them. And because the high students, sometimes the, the students that are in the top 20, sometimes it's like they're people assume maybe that they're going to be okay. Right. But sometimes, you know, my parents who were educators and they went off to, I mean, they didn't go off to university. They did their school here. They went to San Diego State here. Then my dad went on and got his master's. I remember him online. And then he would take off sometimes, I think through Redlands. But they didn't know the process fully either for me in terms of scholarships and things like that. They knew I had to take the SAT. They knew, excuse me, they knew I had to take the SAT. They knew I had to uh, apply. But they didn't know the ins and outs either. And even, but since I was, I, I was, I, I graduated in the top 20 of my class since, since I was there, I, I was never called in. Uh, it, it didn't happen. And I'm, I hope now that, 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 that has changed. And I just want to ensure that that continues. If that practice is still going, I want to see how it is. And can, can it be more? And what about the middle ground? What are their options? I just want to ensure that every student understands their options. And if college isn't the option, there's nothing wrong with that. Mm -hmm. and, and I think sometimes some students are scared to say, I don't want to go to college or they're thinking, oh, college is for these students. And it's kind of like, no, college is for all. But if you really don't believe in college, OK, what are your steps? What do you what do you want to do? And let's 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 how can our school help you get to where you want to be? If you want to be, you know, if some students barber is like a really big thing. And I know you know, the county's starting to have a barber barber thing when I work for alternative ed and HVAC, they're getting that in there. Um and I think, I think that's what we need to know. Like, do you, do they, if there's a career that they don't see themselves in the Valley, well, let's guide them. Let's, let's have something for that. And I think that's important. And that, that's my one dream is, is that the students feel that, oh, I'm from the Valley. I don't, I don't, I don't want that. I, I just don't. It, it's always, it's always hurt me <laughs> to, to hear that idea of I'm from the Valley or that people leave and they come back and they see it as a negative thing to come back. Mm -hmm. Like, um, I, you know, it, it's just, it's just one of those things that it, 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 you know, I don't, I don't enjoy it. I want people to be proud. I don't want people to see it as they take off to college. And then if they come back and work that they didn't make it, it's like, you didn't make it. It's your choice, you know? Or the ones that their career path, I have a couple of friends that didn't come back, but not because they didn't want to. Their career path, you know, is more, more opportunity in bigger cities. But if we help them here, at least maybe they're willing to support, you know, willing to support students down here. If, if, if in their job, doting, donating money, whatever it is that they, they want to support the Valley, give back to the roots. And, and that's where I, I just want the Valley to be the best it can be. I want our schools to be the best. I want our students to be the best. I want our students to feel that they are, you know, they have no limits, no ceiling, right? Yeah. Aim for higher, right? If you aim higher, even if you miss as long, it's like that there's this movie, the Patriot where it, they're saying is aim small, miss small. So it's kind of like, I want our students to aim big or, you know, aim, aim small, aim for a high ceiling. And even if you don't make it, at least you're going to get close. Yeah. And that's what I want. That's my dream. That's what I want. You know what? Um, 
recently well, I, I got to talk to the to the kids i'm gonna say kids because they're really young the kids from valle bota um okay. it's a group of of you know people from the valley that are trying to get people from the valley to go out and vote and something that i noticed was that you know a lot of them got to come or had to come back home because due to covid you know they were out in, in school or whatnot so they had to come back home and i feel that a lot of them you know saw where the valley is at and and they're trying to make it you know make a change um you know especially with voting you know like the more mm -hmm. the more people get to vote a uh, more diverse group of you know elected officials will get so so i think that i see a, a positive trend in terms of you know more people more younger people that went out to college are starting to come back and and starting to um change the valley make it you know some you know something like you said like make everybody proud that we're from the valley and i think that you know yeah, it's it's, yeah. it's it's really um encouraging to see all this stuff and 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 you know you're running um andrew's running you know gil is already in the board so we're, you know and and I mean, I don't really know much in terms of, you know, Brawley School Board or Central. I, I just know from, you know, I don't really get too much involved in the cities. But, um, you know, I wish that we had somebody younger here in the in Calexico running for school board. Um, because, yeah, I, I feel that, you know, bringing new ideas, bringing ideas that, you know, you learned or, or you acquired, you know, when you were away to college and bringing them back, you know, fresh, like you just came back, you know, is... It's gonna help, you know, your city. It's gonna help your school board. Um, and 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 yeah, I mean, it's it's it's. It, it, I think it's encouraging to see all this change. Um, and like I said earlier, it's not only here in the valley. It's, um, you know, across the country, we're seeing younger and younger people run for, for these kinds of positions. And it's you know, it's, we haven't seen it, and it's something different. And it might be scary to older generations to see somebody so young being in a board making decisions and but i think that's something that we i'm gonna say we because i'm somebody that's older that sometimes could also question the fact that you know these younger people are are making decisions but something that something that we you know not we don't pay attention to pay attention to is that you know you grew up in this in this generation we have information in your fingertips or in your keyboard and and you know you guys learn quick so i feel that mm -hmm. um that's something that we gotta focus on when we see these young people running for office um that if they don't know something they're really quick to learn it and pick it up um and, and in terms of you know like even like in the school board you know there's a lot of uh regulations ed code like all these different mm -hmm. things that that um go on when it comes to making decisions or trying to implement something and you know i talk to gil a lot and i know that he spends a lot of time um you know learning he talks to a lot of people which is something that i feel that um also we don't see that a lot where like say you would run and or somebody else would run and they will lose um but yet you have like these really cool ideas. Um, and I feel that, you know, we need to um, harvest those ideas. Like even if you don't, if you don't win, like whoever won, like should keep in contact with this person and oh. say like, you know, let's work together. Let's, you know, I like what you're, where you're going. And I feel that we need to do the, do the, do that a lot more than, than we do. Um, we're almost at an hour. Is there something that mm -hmm. we didn't talk about that you would like to, you know, final thoughts kind of thing? Um no, I think that that pretty much covers it. And, and just the main one, I ended it with Gil as well, but it's just that our parents, you know, you're a parent, I'm a parent, uh, you know, I have my parents and, and I think at the end of the day, that is one of the main things that also needs to be focused upon and also, you know, thanked is, is through distance learning without our parents, there's no way it, it, it can't be done. And, and parents, meaning, and if students hear this, you know, it's whoever, whoever is helping you and taking care of you. You know, when I worked in all TED, some, some students, that was a, a rough topic to talk about, but I was just, whoever's taking care of you, the parents, I, I use parents more as a general term is whoever you see as your parent, whoever you see that is taking care of you and helping you throughout distance learning, helping you in life and that, and, and all through that, you know, without our parents, you know, it, things would not work. Things would not work and, and I wouldn't even be able to be doing what I'm doing without my parents, you know, and and that's the biggest thing that also 
I want to contribute in the board is we need to have also parental support and in, in hear our parents out. And again, you know, we can't do everything, right? But as long as I think we are able to hear them and listen to them and try our best, I, I think, you know, that's the foundation of a successful uh, school district is you have to have parent support. You have to have parents that believe and you have to have parents that are going to help their students. That is that is the ultimate foundation. And and I was very lucky enough to have parents that that gave me that foundation, even though I had my rebellious teenage years and, and I thought I knew everything, you know, I, I, they still were able to st- stick with me and, and keep me keep me grounded and then help me out throughout my mistakes that I made as a teenager throughout my mistakes I made in my 20s. And, you know, I a lot of people say I'm young. I, I'm now I'm now I just had my birthday and I'm now 32 years old. So I'm, I'm getting up there, you know, I'm getting up there. But um, I think, again, some people worry about age and I, I don't think age should matter. I, I think it should just be more about what do you bring to the table? And at the end of the day, it's like, I know there's people that are, are older than me that have way more experience and how can they guide me on stuff? Cause what if I have a great idea and they agree with it? I think it is good to have that on the board too, where they can be like, okay, hold on, hold on young buck. I like this idea, but I've been on this and I've seen the ins and outs of the legislation. Let me help guide you. Cause I like this idea that I did not know. Let's help guide and work together to make it, you know, proper. And maybe so I could learn the ed codes, everybody on a board at one point or another, no matter the age, if you get on board at age 50 and you get on a board at age 32, at the end of the day, that's still year one. So your experience is still yeah. the same amount. You know, it's year one, year one experience on the board. You know, it, it, to me, it, it, it doesn't matter. And, and we need our parents and I hope I have parental support and I want the board to have parental support. And I just want to thank my parents as always that I would not be here. Trust me, I would not be in this position without their help when, especially in my teens, especially in my early twenties and even now, and, and, and I was one that for education, you know, for, for school, uh, I, I would not have gotten the grades. I would not have gotten in the top 20 of my class without my, my parent support. Um, you know, I easily could have, could have gotten lazy. I easily could have, you know, not done certain things. I, I even got older and looked back and I was like, man, no wonder they pushed me so much. Cause they saw potential in me that maybe if I would have tried harder in school, Um, I could have maybe gotten higher. I don't, I don't know, but I was very lucky to have that foundation. And I think it is important that when I worked for alternative ed and I had students, you know, that, you know, in the juvenile hall and things like that, that didn't have that foundation. I think it's important that we figure out a way to, for students to feel that they have a foundation, that they have a support, even if it's through counselors, through teachers, even if it's the board, who knows? that they feel that they have that foundation, that they are supported to, you know, go on further, that they are supported to believe in themselves, that they are supported, um, you know, to have what they need in order to be successful. Cause not everybody is blessed with the same foundation. We're all different. And I think it's important that students know that and that students feel that their district has their back. And, and I think, I think we need that. And that's important. Yeah, for sure. Carlos, thank you so much for the time. Um, once again, I want to remind everybody this is not an endorsement. Um, it's just you and me getting to know um, the candidate. Um, I want to thank you again for the time. Um, and um, yeah, I want to thank everybody for listening. Yeah. And um, don't hang up yet. Um, but yeah, I want to thank everybody to listen. Thank everybody for listening. Um, and remember, stay safe, wash your hands, wear your face mask. Let's keep this trend of the numbers going down, you know, going. Um, And yeah, thank you guys for listening and we'll see you in the next one.